Welcome everyone. This is the Jenkins Contributor Summit. It's the closing session for February 25th, 2021. Delighted that you're here with us. Thanks very much for being part of the summit. Thank you for your participation in the tracks. Thanks for to those especially who led the tracks. Um, Oleg Nanashev, Alyssa Tong, Cara Delamarque, and thank you very, very much for what you've done. Uh, very grateful for it. So let's take on first um, today's agenda. What we'd like to do is go through each of the tracks and allow each track to present, each track leader to present a summary of their observations from the track comments, the notes from the tracks, we'd like to gather into a single shared folder so that the detailed notes are still available. Right now that folder happens to be sitting in my Google Drive, we'll likely consolidate there. First, we'll ask, invite Oleg Nanashev to discuss securing the Jenkins delivery pipeline and the experiences and observations there. Then I'll take on containers and platforms. Caro will discuss cloud native Alyssa will discuss advocacy and events, and then I'll take on documentation. So let's go ahead with Oleg. I think you'll probably prefer to share your own screen for navigation purposes. So I'm going to no, stop sharing. Uh, that is just one slide. Oh, OK, great. OK. <clears throat> yeah, so we reviewed um, Jenkins delivery pipelines, in particular uh, uh, plugin uh, pipelines, also uh, other components like uh, Jenkins libraries. Um, one of the main focuses during the discussion was uh, job 229 uh, created by uh, JC, which provides continuous delivery for plugins. We reviewed uh, what steps uh, needed there to get uh, this job over the line, including documentation, including support for final release. There were also discussions about version schema, about uh, impact on Gradle flow, uh, which uh, would need a similar implementation if you wanted to, to adopt it uh, across the entire plugin ecosystem. And the second part was about uh, security scanning tools, what would we like to adopt uh, in our pipelines and how to adopt that. So the action plan for us is yeah, finalizing the job to nine. Um, then uh, code QL scans, which uh, have been uh, evaluated by Daniel. Uh, um, it will be great to finish that and make it available uh, for to developers. Same for Sneak. Um, it would, it's available, but we need uh, to configure that so that maintainers can use that if uh, they want. And uh, we also want to evaluate other security tools available on the GitHub Actions Marketplace. So can you can you help me understand or help us understand a little more detail on the security scanning tools for the pipeline? The containers track talked about SNCC security scanning Docker images, but I'm assuming that's not what this is describing. Can you give me a little more detail on that? Yeah, so SNCC uh, has multiple flavors. Actually, uh, there are multiple products offered, offered by the company. Uh, but yeah, the core product is basically security scan and dependency analysis, including the licenses, but yeah, also uh, vulnerabilities, etc. And this is what uh, the Linux Foundation offers as a part of LFX. So LFX is a platform uh, for uh, projects. Uh, there are a dozen of different tools available, and one of them is security scanning. So currently they are configured for all Jenkins repositories, but we don't have access. So is, this is something we need to fix. So, so in this case, what it's doing is if, if, for instance, the Git plugin is wanting to understand, have a security scan, they will scan looking for vulnerable dependencies or, or is this more at some, uh, some other level? vulnerable dependencies and the source code analysis. This is what is enabled by default. Ah, so it's it's got a, a source code analysis, something like an advanced form of, of find bugs kind of thing where it's actually looking for issues in the sources. Okay. Has have people here used it? Because we tried it at work and didn't find it that great at scale, at least on the ignoring, ignoring um, 
like false positive wise, it was quite bad. And at the time, you definitely couldn't couldn't ignore false positives. Um, and so we we abandoned it. Um, yeah, that's a part of the problem on LFX reports uh, something like 80,000 uh, vulnerabilities. Uh, many of them are just uh, transit dependencies, for example, on old Jenkins core, because yeah, when it does uh, the scan uh, similar uh, to other projects, it, it cannot make an assumption that, okay, it's not just a dependency, it's a standalone uh, component. Uh, we had the same issue with other scans, uh, for example, for um, uh, yeah. For was dependency check, I created a set of rules which would exclude uh, issues reported to the Jenkins core and other plugins. But yeah, that's, uh, what we, that's what we end up using because it's got quite good exclusion support. Yeah. But yeah, basically now we can generate these exclusions from uh, security advisor metadata. But uh, without that, uh, it's just a huge number of false positives because yeah, Sneak just has no idea what is Jenkins packaging format. And yeah, it applies to many other tools. Okay, so so the, the, the issue there then is that a transitive dependency in a Jenkins um, plugin may in fact not be not be included or or it's a, a version is included that's much newer than the version described in the transitive dependency. Uh, I, I'm not Jenkins sure I'm understanding. abuses uh, uh, Maven uh, packaging system. So basically what happens uh, in POMXML, you declare, define a dependency on a plugin as a jar. And then Maven HPI plugin does some magic uh, tricks in order to determine whether it's a jar or a plugin and based on that it does packaging. So for a security tool, uh, which is not aware about Maven HPI plugin, there is no way to say whether there is a real dependency or a plugin dependency. Uh, for Jenkins core, it's a bit different because uh, the dependency is provided, but still uh, they catch issues there. Or maybe it's not even provided. Maybe it's also a declared dependency. Got it, thank you. Mm -hmm. So on a, on a different topic, the code QL scans, I know that I was, I was one of the early experimenters with those and found them quite positive because they, they from in my case, knew things specifically about the Jenkins code base and about problems that are, that are not generic, but they're rather very much, oh, this is a, pro this is a type of problem we see in Jenkins. So what, what does it mean to widely roll those out? That means they'll be more available. Will plugin maintainers still need to choose to subscribe or will that be, is it envisioned that that would be turned, turned on for everybody and suddenly we've got a lot of noise or what, what's the, the idea there? This is something we discussed. And uh, if I recall correctly, the um, intention is to rather enable it globally. So Daniel may correct me if I'm wrong. I think the problem for the default way that this is supposed to work through GitHub Actions um, and GitHub status checks is that the configuration needs to be in each individual repository. So even once I make the Jenkins specific code kill um, warnings or detectors public, uh, they need still would need to be configured on a per repository basis as would any security scan that integrates with uh, GitHub code scanning. Um, the current approach where it's run on project infrastructure and I just update uh, the default branches findings periodically uh, does not have this limitation, but obviously isn't as nice as having statuses integrated in pull requests and regularly scanning uh, when as on commit. So I'm not sure there's a great solution here other than perhaps programmatically creating pull requests that adds add the action and uh, basically advertise it that way. Oh, okay. So I had failed to comprehend that. I could actually have code QL scans enabled on my pull requests in, in, in the future where a PR comes in and CodeQL will scan it before I even do the code review. So 
Uh, yes. Um, so I would like to distinguish between CodeQL in general, which is just yet another static code analysis tool you may know from lgtm.com, and uh, the Jenkins security scan. I basically use CodeQL, rip out everything that you know is about general Java APIs and add a bunch of Jenkins stuff in there. Um, you can already have CodeQL because it's public uh, and provided by GitHub. You need to add an action and you have it. This is the future I also envision for the Jenkins security scan based on CodeQL, um, but we're not there yet uh, because so far the rules are sort of in private beta, as I mentioned before. Okay, so so they'll they'll eventually transition from private beta to to more widely available, but then then likely globally available to all plugins, to all all Jenkins repositories. And if I enable it myself in my plugin, do I then I then get also PR reviews included, or will it PR reviews be included when it's deployed globally? Or don't know yet. I think uh, it integrates with pull requests because it would use the same APIs as the existing GitHub security scans use, and that's a big selling point for those. But I have not yet tried to integrate it to that level. Great, thank you. Okay, uh, other questions from others? No. All right. Uh, thanks very, very much. So I, I think the next step then is some some portion of this next week or or tomorrow ish gets conceptualized into the Jenkins roadmap. Oleg, yes, you've sort of been our lead on roadmap. How how would you see that working? I, you would just go through nodes um, and create a pull request uh, with uh, roadmap items. So if um, track leaders uh, want to create their own pull requests, it's also a way to go. And do you have a, so you'd be okay if I created a pull request just trying to read notes or do you want to be the one to create the pull request for these these yeah. ideas? You're welcome to do that. No, okay. you can leave the security part to me or you can just split it later offline. With okay. Other organizers. Great. Excellent. Thanks. Anything else on this topic before we go forward? Okay. So mine is containers and platforms. Um, we had a discussion on on well the the key results here were first. Uh, we want to continue the roadmap work that we had actually outlined already in 2020. Um, that roadmap work included delivering, we want in the future to deliver multi-platform Docker images with support for ARM64, uh, System 390 mainframes, and PowerPC64. Now the, the motivation for System 390 and PowerPC may not be obvious to, to this group, the crucial motivation is IBM is investing engineering talent in helping us improve our Docker images. And so we think it's a good, healthy, healthy change to say, let's find a way to do multi-platform. We'll get ARM64 as a result of that and the System 390 mainframe and their PowerPC platform. So we're very grateful to Jim Crowley for his work with the, the uh, platform SIG and we're going to continue that. Now we've got additional challenges with governance of our Docker images. Uh, in particular, it's not clear right now which of the images are well-maintained and which ones are not as well-maintained. So the idea that we discussed was we'd like to submit a Jenkins enhancement proposal, a JEP, which proposes the concept of a Docker image maintainer and that if an image does not have a maintainer, it would be marked as adopt this image. The idea being that we want to encourage community contributors by seeing that the image is up for adoption that, oh, they might benefit by being involved. Uh, as an example, the complexity here is, I'm very interested in the Debian image and somewhat interested in the Alpine image. 
So those two get my attention, but I don't pay any attention to the CentOS image. And yet we know there are people who value that image very much, but we've not communicated, hey, we need a new main, uh, additional maintainers for that. So the idea is let's let's create the con use the concept of code owners from GitHub and use that to identify maintainers for specific images. If it's unmaintained, we need to find a way to flag it probably in the Docker Hub readme that it's um, that is uh, it is up for adoption. We've also found, and thanks to Daniel for highlighting this one, that our Docker image build process is just too slow. And, and we've got solid agreement, we need to accelerate the speed at which we can build Docker images that may involve optimizations in build technique. It may involve reducing the number of images we build. Um, we're open to all sorts of things like that, but we think accelerating the Docker image build process is good for the health of the project and good for the image maintenance. The additional item we've added is we would like to regularly scan Docker images for issues. I've been running a prototype with Sneak uh, and okay, the number of image issues that they report are somewhat, somewhat dismaying in terms of, wow, the base Debian image has a lot of, of issues that they're reporting as unresolved and no mitigation. And so it's, it's going to be a little complicated for us to, to use that and find a way to handle the volume. I think it, it's somewhat similar to the, the scanning problem mentioned in the securing the delivery pipeline topic. Then, then in terms of cloud, we see that we're continuing to use the Helm charts for the Jenkins, Jenkins controller. And we know that we're using more and more Helm charts for Jenkins infrastructure. We think those continue. And we, we look forward to the cloud native uh, work that's going on on Kubernetes operators. Any questions on those topics? Yes, how would the um, image ownership be exposed to uh, administrators or users for plugins? It's directly visible in Jenkins in the plugin manager, as well as on the plugin site, but if I'm the normal Jenkins administrator and I docker pull or docker run, how would I be informed that the image is currently unmaintained? It's, that one's not clear to us. One of the ideas we discussed, but haven't had any, any implementation or proof of concept was wondering, should we consider adding a, what I think is called an administrative monitor, uh, a warning that hey, you're running a Docker image and we've checked back and see that it's marked as up for adoption. Uh, we did think that we could do badges on the readmes pretty easily. Uh, what we weren't sure of is if the administrative monitor idea was worth considering. I'm open to suggestions there. Do you have, do you have recommendations? Uh, if I can just add something, basically something that we also discussed was to, to introduce a concept where we would just stop building image for a specific distribution or for a specific use case as well. So maybe if we realize that we don't have a maintainer for a specific image, let's say for three months, and we are not merging peers, maybe we can just say, um, we stop providing that image. So we, we there is no way uh, to get notified if an image is not maintained, any, if an image is maintained or is not maintained anymore except by not being able to download it. I mean, you, you pull the latest tag anyway, so people would just end up complaining that their image variant doesn't exist yet, and we would get dozens and dozens of people reporting, and then we're like, well, nobody's maintaining it, so we're no longer publishing in it, and they were like, well, thank you for not telling us. I don't think it's a particularly uh, practical approach. Um, I like the idea of the admin monitor. Um, I've thought about that recently in the context of it would be useful to be able to tell Jenkins how it's being run through a startup parameter um, and integrating that into the default packaging stuff and the images could say, well, I'm this kind of Docker image variant. So that could be um, combined with that. And the other is, I think if, if I run the image, there's probably a startup shell script of some sort 
that could also call to a well-known URL in the Jenkins project and see whether it is still actively maintained. And if not, show a giant warning before Jenkins actually starts up to say, well, you're probably not going to get um, image security updates. Yep. There is also a third thing we mentioned that could be used for that particular topic. These are using image labels, which mean at the moment of time, if we consider a given image uh, to be deprecated, we we override the tag, we push the, exactly the same contents, except that a label that mentioned the current support status from the community is switched from supported to deprecated, for instance. That could also help, especially in an environment where you have some, let's say, admission controller that validates the metadata of the images. That could uh, trigger warning or help administrator because if we give these rules, they can do whatever they need to, to check only by checking the label. That could be also a third complementary option. So, and, and those labels are, are those from the, the label schema that, that we were discussing, Damien? Can you describe a little further there? Yes, the, they are label schemas. It, it's more Garrett, the specialist on that part, but um, th there are two standard label schemas on OCI and the second one. So they provide a set of recommended label to sets like the Git, uh, uh, the URL of the Git repository where the source that was used to build a given image is located, the date time, eventually the commits of that specific repository, but there are some more. Here, I'm not speaking about uh, a standard label, but a custom label that all the Docker images that we provide as a community. And the label could be something like io.jenkins.communitysupport equals, and a string and a string could be either supported, deprecated, unsupported, uh, security alerts. So the idea will be to only update the label of a given image when we know there is an issue in particular security issue. It's not, it, will, it won't, fix all the issues, but it's one of the numerous way we can have to communicate information additionally to what you already said. Yeah, but you would need uh, to also update uh, the image uh, to check uh, the labels. So you would need to self-check yes. and uh, to print some warnings. Maybe that is correct. <laughs> even preferably in the Jenkins web UI somehow, for example, administrative monitor, which checks this metadata. Yep. So it's possible, but it's, only possible for new images, not for historical ones. Oh, you can, we already override images when there is an upstream update on the parent image. Tags are not immutable on Docker and they should not be considered. It's really important to advertise that mm -hmm. tags can be overridden for important updates. And so yeah. since we can override a tag, we can override the label, but that's some machinery to add. So you're right, first with the new images, but still, I mean, there is an API in the Docker Hub, so a script that lists the, the, all the tags existing and that update them to have a JSON file that maps the status of each tag and each support. This is something that can be technically done. It's a bit of time to spend, but it's not a complex one. It's only a matter of time. Great. Any, any other comments or concerns there? All right, so I have one more slide. Things that are not on the Platforms and Containers 2021 list. And I'm intentionally noting here that we've got a roadmap item for Java 15 plus support, and it was not discussed. And my recommendation is that we will, we do not plan during 2021 to breach this, even if Java 17 releases. Uh, I think we have other things that are higher priority and higher value to the Jenkins project than doing Java 17 support. Now, I'm open to your comments here because I fear this may be very controversial. People may say, no, that's not acceptable. If the new LTS for Java is Java 17 and is available. Uh, Tim, did you have a, a question or a concern there? I was just gonna say, to my knowledge, it works. Uh, the Jenkins core tests pass on Java 15. Um, there's possibly edge cases that don't work, but pipeline works. We're starting to see people with higher than Java 11 versions are starting to appear in usage stats now. 
Um, so when JNA was updated in 2.274, that made pipeline start working. Um, and I ran the um, I ran the unit tests in Jenkins Core on 11 to 15 and made some minor adjustments to a test only fixes, but it all passes. It's just not regularly tested. Oh, that's wonderful. That's great news. Thank you for that result. Oleg, did you have a comment or concern there? No, no I think that um, if we can uh, at least uh, test it in our pipelines, it's something we should do. And uh, once we see that uh, it actually works, uh, I mean, Java 17 LTS, we can just uh, mark, uh, mark it as preview support, similar to how we did with Java 11. Good, okay. Now I have not been following the Java 15 and beyond release schedule. Uh, are there those on the call who know the estimated timeline for Java 17? Is it, is it likely in 2021 or is it more likely 2022 uh, or beyond? Autumn uh, 2021. Mm. Autumn of 2021, okay. So we, we could see it, this, we likely will see it this calendar year, okay. All right, so, so the, for now, the Java 15 plus roadmap item will stay in that column where it is right now, which is future. And if, if things work out that we could move it from there to, to in progress, that would be great as well. Okay, any, any other questions here before we go on to Kara? All right. Um, so at the cloud native city track, we we discussed some of the initiatives that we're already working on within the cloud native SIG, which you're all welcome to join. Um, it's Fridays at 4200 UTC. Uh, it's quite exciting because we're really looking at how to refine and shape a Jenkins cloud native future. So there's a lot of ideas, <laughs> which is nice. And and one of the things you, you can go to the next slide, Mark. One of the things I really liked about this track is that um, we had we had people who don't necessarily aren't able to make it to the um, SIG meeting, the regular Friday one, and so we had different um, different approaches, different concerns, and different suggestions and ideas of how to move forward, which I thought was really really cool. So we looked back on the the existing roadmap, and it became clear that some of our users. Um, they struggle when there's like the restart charms of Jenkins basically. So when it fails, the restart charms. And there were different ways of approaching how to improve this. Pluggable storage was definitely brought up and this is already on the roadmap. But if you look um, at the cloud native pluggable storage page on Jenkins IO, there's actually already a lot of gems on this, a lot. And they, um, it's been going, this discussion has been ongoing for, for some time. So we, we went over what had been discussed, what POCs were, were uh, already in existence and um, other ways of approaching the problem or a way to improve, say, uh, restore time. And one of the ideas that Gareth um, has been looking at was improving uh, web, the, Webhooks, but I'm going to let Gareth talk more about that because he's done an awesome POC on that. So uh, that that was an interesting approach to that problem. And I'm relatively new to this, that particular problem of pluggable storage with Jenkins. So it was really interesting discussion for me. And then we also discussed um, some of the initiatives that we're working on in the Cloud Native SIG around looking at um, I guess integrations with pipelines. So uh, integrations with Tekton. So we were looking at the Tekton client plugin um, and also cloud events plugin. So the cloud events discussion was quite interesting because it very much, it really brings together sort of a, a way of having greater interoperability. Also, there's a lot of discussion with how Tekton is doing cloud events. We briefly discussed that this is not particularly the Genius project, but really interesting. We, we discussed um, the Four Keys open source project, which takes cloud events from different CI CD tools and will create a really nice dashboard for you looking at some key door metrics. Um, so that was 
a very nice use case of how you would use cloud events. I will likely bring that forward into GSOC and let the students, especially the student, if we have students working on the cloud events plugin, they can then use this project for um, testing some of their work and seeing immediately the, you know, how their work is beneficial. So that was quite cool. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so then we discussed more about DIA cloud events support. Okay, I will let Gareth speak more, especially about um, his webhook work. Cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the um, one of the frustrations that was was coming up was having Jenkins lose all of its webhook events when it's being restarted, and if a restart sort of takes somewhere between five and ten minutes, that's, that's um, quite a common thing. Um, you're going to lose information, especially if your Jenkins is quite busy. Um, builds aren't going to trigger, and then you have to go and manually kick them off again. So it's just yeah, it's a bit annoying. So we felt we could we could probably solve this quite easily by offloading um, the sort of webhook handlers uh, or just to a, a sort of store and forward webhook relay that um, would work with Kubernetes quite well. Uh, so we created a little POC to see if it would work and it, yeah, it does work quite nicely. I'll pop the link to the POC in the demo, in the chat, if people are interested. Um, it's currently using like a back off strategy to relay webhooks. So if it can't connect, it will just keep retrying and that retry gets longer and longer up until like a max um, time that you can set. Uh, and then hopefully Jenkins can recover in that period of time. But uh, we should be able to add a series of strategies in there quite easily. One of them we were thinking is to write the webhook to uh, a CRD and just read from those CRDs. Um, but that would allow us to run with multiple instances of the webhook thing. Um, but it's, it's already in Golang. It's very small, very small footprint. Um, it runs with very low sort of memory overhead um, and CPU overhead. So you can just pop it in the same namespace as Jenkins. Um, it exposes its own ingress. Um, and you can, yeah. So now, and will that how will that interact with the with the automatic webhook registration that happens in Jenkins already? Would would that somehow be magically included in that automatic registration, or does so, do I have to change my webhooks to point at the at that at this alternate endpoint? So that is an outstanding question that came up when we were discussing this because we didn't know how that worked. Um, uh, so does I. <laughs> There's an advanced option in the, if, if you are using that, which I think a lot of places don't use it, um, oh. but if you are using it, there's a, if you click advanced, there's the alternate host name for Jenkins. Um, so you can put an alternate host name in and then click re-register all hooks. I'm not sure if it will delete your old ones if your host name changes, but. Okay, so, so there is already a facility to support this kind of pattern. And I would just have to use it. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. It's mostly used for like split DNS where you've just where internally you've got a host name and externally it's something different that's coming in. Any other questions for Gareth? Or, or for Kara for that matter. All right. Next step then. Advocacy and events. Let's see, Alyssa, you are here. Great. Yep, so I'm here. Thanks, Mark. All right. Um, hi, everybody. So in an effort to foster the, the community relations and uh, grow the Jenkins brand awareness, uh, we would like to propose the following ideas uh, be added to the roadmap. The first one is education outreach. The mm -hmm. in the intent here is to establish Jenkins awareness and usage while a person is still in the college system. Um, so this is kind of like the mindset of getting the horse before the cart, if you will, right? The hope here is that these students will become experienced Jenkins users and eventually down the road that they would want to contribute to the project. 
So similar case to the GSOC student that Kara mentioned the other day, where the previous year he was a, he was a, a candidate, and then the following year he's coming back to become, I believe, a mentor or something like that, Kara. But but that is the intention is to get more awareness of Jenkins because we know that once these students graduate and go into the workforce, most of them will most likely be using Jenkins. So, um, so that's that. Um, for DevOps World Community Track, so much like previous years, um, CloudBees has given us a track which will consist of 24 sessions we can do whatever we want to do with it. Um, I thought it would be a good uh, way for us to strategize how we want to shape this track, right? How much or how little do we want Jenkins content? Is there a specific message that we want to amplify? And this is our chance to do it here because DevOps World is our biggest event of the year. Um, and then other things that we want to cover within the community. How do we want this, this track to look like? So I'm hoping that we can come together and, and um, identify or strategize this. And also, you know, the people that are signing up for this will also be reviewing um, proposed talks submissions through the CFP. Uh, diversity in the Jenkins community. So the goal here is to establish diversity and inclusion. So we know that what we're typically, typically are seeing is that the people who are currently involved are pretty much the same usual suspects, right? Similar in nationality and gender, age, um, et cetera. So this begs the question, what can we do to bring a, a wider, broader uh, range of people to contribute to the project? And we know there's just so much to do, right? There's so many ways to participate. Um, so how do, we, how do we get more people, diversity, inclusion, make it more welcoming, making it more easy for people to contribute to the project? eliminate the barrier to entry. Um, and so, so far the plan here is increase the outreach efforts to bring more people to Jenkins, reinforce the Google Summer of Code, which I think um, is doing excellent year by year. Um, mentor She Code Africa contribution in April, um, highlight the people of the Jenkins project and um, the thought here is that there's so many people that are doing great things, right? Uh, that are contributing in great ways, but we're not really highlighting them. We want to make sure that they feel special and that we give them um, a platform to showcase what they do um, and that we do appreciate the contributions. And that effort, I hope that we will continue to be able to grow and foster the community in, in a way that we want, which is diversity and inclusion. Um, the last item that we'd like to propose to add to the roadmap is to um, uh, encourage new members to advocate for Jenkins, um, get more people to participate in the SIG. Um, you know, we, again, we know that there's, we get the same people that is contributing to the project. So, um, how do we get more people to, to, to help us and participate? Any questions? All right, thanks everybody. Oh, go ahead. Maybe one question. Um, so for 2021, uh, would we like to organize any specific hackathons or community events? Good point. Yes, and I think we should. Absolutely. It feels like um, we've got Hacktoberfest that we can predict will arrive. We had great results last year with the UI UX Hackfest in, it was, what was that, May, if I remember right, that we did it. I think, yeah, I think a, a May or a, a, I don't know if it's May or if it's in April in conjunction with She Code Africa if we did a, a hack fest for the month of month of May or month of April, 
might be a great fit for a way to do greater outreach. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that we have a couple of opportunities. Um, so we got CDCon in June as well. We wanna do something there. And of course, DevOps World in September. Yeah, at CDCon, um, it's just spur of the moment idea, but actually it would be so fun if we had, I wouldn't want to exclude other projects, but it, it would be really fun to do a hackathon around the time of CDCon, which was Jenkins and Tekton, because <laughs> we had such a funny discussion in the cloud native track. Basically, I, I, I realized with the Tekton client plugin, one of the things where we try and do with Jenkins is actually to run Tekton pipelines, or at least in partially. There are initiatives with Tekton, or at least under discussion, to <laughs> run Jenkins jobs from Tekton. I just think this is hilarious. And I think it's it's really interesting. It'd be really fun to, to put uh, more people together to discuss these these different initiatives. So I I think that would be awesome if we could somehow arrange some sort of hackathon with Jenkins and Tekton. Probably around CDCon would make the most sense. Good, good idea. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. So Alyssa, I'm, I'm going to assume that you'll take notes here. Sorry that I'm not taking notes live, but I'm sharing my screen. That's yep. okay. Yep. It's perfect. And, and we've got the recording if we need to refer back to the recording too. Yes. I would suggest guys, this is your deal. I would suggest that if you're interested in outreach, I would suggest to go to places where predominantly that community exists, say, Detroit, places like that, as opposed to all the same things, the same conferences. So, so you say places, you, did you say Detroit? I'm, can you elaborate a little bit further? Yeah, if, if, you, if, if, the, if the idea is to outreach efforts to bring people to Jenkins and you want to have diversity, look for them where they are. Uh, I'm based in South Florida, so we're, there's a lot of Latinos and Hispanics here. Uh, hang out with the universities in that area. Same things in Detroit, right? New Orleans, right? That's a great idea. Good suggestion. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much. Yeah, well, I think we all look forward to in-person yeah. events. <laughs> exactly. Everybody don't is. forget the, the non-university or so students. I don't mm. know for the US because I'm not based there, but in Europe there are there is a big split between university that are like high level studies that mm -hmm. only some privileged people because of how human work uh, can access. You also have a lot of people that are doing night courses or yeah. alternative schools that might not give you a master of engineering or development professional training, but still there are people changing careers coming from also other unexpected backgrounds and that's also a good source of people that are willing to contribute learning coming from different minorities in terms of genders, different backgrounds. So don't forget, because most of the time we think about university because it, students are a good, uh, let's say, um, um, garden to grow with. But they are not only, and if we really want to push forward that project, it's one of the way of doing this. I don't say it's the only or the main, but that's an interesting part to consider. Cara, yeah, you've been right. involved in building a community in the London area. Any insights that your experience there might help guide us on? Yes, I think Damien is entirely correct. Thank you for saying that, Damien. I think that's wonderful. Um, certainly, I've been very involved with Codebar. I've been involved in, in London area because I, I live in London, but um, Codebar is actually a global organization. So we have... We have a lot of uh, chapters around the world and in different countries and cities. So that is an interesting place to start to engage. And certainly, I would say in almost any, any large city, um, there's a lot of tech meetup groups, like a ton. And people really are always trying to learn. And it is good to outreach. It doesn't just have to be a Jenkins outreach group or um, a CICD outreach group certainly considering on a more broader level of just developers who are trying to learn and bringing Jenkins to them. That is a great idea. Thank you. Yeah, so it prompts a, 
I may need to look locally here. You make me think that I, I rarely suggest pro a proposal to present to local people that I'm nearby, and yet they're probably as interested as, as the others are. Good, thanks very much. Any other feedback for Alyssa? Okay, next topic then, documentation. So documentation was a reminder for me of, of how worldwide our organization is. We did two tracks intentionally, the East track and the West track. And we did that because the West track was the middle of the night for the East track and, and it worked quite well. So thanks very much to the participants there. Um, first step, we want to continue the 2020 roadmap work. Uh, I misstated in our opening session that 50% of plugins had migrated to docs. I was wrong. It was one third. Sorry that I, I, I am apparently math challenged. Uh, we've had over 600 plugins migrate their documentation and that's great, but we have over 1800. So we've got, we've still got quite a ways to go on plugin doc migration. Likewise, the wiki document migration will continue. The pace is relatively slow there because the work requires skills in assessing the accuracy of the wiki documentation that in many cases could be as much as 10 or 12 years old. We know that we want to continue terminology cleanup. We've got deprecated terms that are used in many places in user visible strings that we'd like to replace. And that's actually a good candidate as a project as part of the She Code Africa effort in, in, in April. Terminology cleanup would be a good one for that. Likewise, cleanup of the screenshots uh, that are on the Jenkins.io site. Right now, we've got screenshots that are based on Jenkins versions prior to 2.277.1. So before the tables to divs introduction. Tables to divs makes a much nicer UI, but it means we need to update the screenshots. Um, additional outreach efforts, we'd like to mentor a 2021 Google Season of Docs writer. Now that's a little challenging because the, the application period closes in less than one month. So the docs SIG will be working on getting that, our application as a project. There are some financial complexities there that they've changed their methodology a little bit that we have to work through with the board to see if we can understand how to do it successfully. And we realize that we've got our, our last year's Google season of docs um, writer highlighted to us that the onboarding experience could use improving. And so we're going to work on improving the onboarding experience and have several different ideas of ways to make that experience better so that people can more readily contribute to documentation. Uh, next piece is improving our documentation sites. Uh, so we've already got a running prototype. Thanks sincerely to Gavin Morgan, to Olivia Vernin, and to Jonathan Moraes from Brazil um, for their suggestions and the implementation. Right now, if you look at plugins.jenkins.io, you'll see a little icon that says search by Algolia. Uh, what we're getting there is where we used to search with an embedded version of Elasticsearch inside the plugin site API. Gavin in the last few days has switched it over to use an Algolia based search engine that is providing the, the search results for us. Uh, the improvement is, is nice. It's still under work. There are still some surprises, some things that we're having to work out, but it looks very positive. The intent is that Olivier and Gavin will work together to register us for the Algolia open source program and we'll use the plugin sites as, site as an experiment to prepare for the eventual use of that same indexing technology on the www.jenkins.io site. Next, or any questions so far? Sorry, I should have asked for questions, see if anybody had concerns or, or issues they wanted to raise. Okay, next then is we've realized that we've got an awful lot of documentation. We've got a large body of documentation in varying stages. The wiki in particular has, has collected documentation and knowledge from people over the course of 10 or more years. Uh, however, we don't have a systematic where do we put that information when we transform it? And we realized as a, as a doc sig 
that we need to structure where is that going to go in the future, even if that arrival is still a year or two away. Um, we need to know that so that we've understood, do we have the right structure for our documentation? And so what we're going to do over the course of the next several months in the office hours for the documentation special interest group is we will look at where would this content go and this content go. Jonathan Morais had started the process for us and uh, the thousand plus pages that we had have been initially reviewed. We'll do a more detailed review and work through that. Now, one more piece of that is we've got currently a Confluence Wiki running that's running read only. So that Wiki needs to migrate because we'd rather not have to upgrade the Confluence server. It's read only. It's not providing an awful lot of help for users um, in terms of the Wiki facilities of it. It's just acting like a web server. So one of the ideas that was discussed was, what if we batch transform those Wiki pages to ASCII doc host them inside of a GitHub repository, and then redirect the wiki to that site. The idea is that would now let us incrementally and stepwise use those ASCII doc files eventually as the basis for content in www.jenkins.io. They are not in general immediately usable because they're of, of varying levels of quality, varying levels of accuracy, um, some of, sometimes it's just plain flawed information that we have to filter out before we go to Jenkins.io. Any, any questions or concerns there? One question. All right. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, it's, it's, all this, it's all this documentation searchable easily. Everybody goes to Google all the time to search for it. Is this... Your, your, your observation is correct right now. All of the content is, is found through Google searches, right? There isn't a site search for www.jenkins.io at all. We envision that being there, but right now the, the solution for typical users is Google search or Bing search or you choose your search engine. Any, any other comments? Yeah, maybe okay. just a question of timing, because yeah, once we tear down the entire wiki, we uh, will be able to also shut down wiki exporter service, or maybe uh, replace it by something else. Um, but yeah. So now I was assuming that we would, oh no, I guess we wouldn't. You're right, Wiki Exporter, even for plugin documentation, Wiki Exporter, this would resolve that as well, right? Because it would have already converted the any remaining plugin documentation on the Jenkins Wiki would now be ASCII doc, but stored in this separate repository awaiting them. Yeah. Right. yeah. So, well, it's not a big achievement, but it's still something to keep in mind. Mm. But yeah. Finally, stopping confluence, it would be a great thing, especially if you're able not only to migrate documentation, but actually to renew or remove uh, obsolete documentation because many pages are just not relevant anymore. So, even if you do such migration, maybe it works, uh, reviewing uh, uh, pages and uh, removing uh, ones we do not want to see. Mm, right. Okay, other comments or concerns? Okay, uh, that covered it. Now, Jesse, I saw that you had arrived. I, went, I am happy to go back and talk to securing the delivery pipeline again if, if there are concerns that you had. Were there, were there topics you wanted to be sure we discussed? No, I don't think so. I actually have to drop again. <laughs> All right. Okay. I'm glad it got talked about. All right. Anyone else? Are there concerns or issues, things that you would like to like to be sure that we we discuss here before we close? Does anyone want to see a blue ocean in Jenkins Classic? 
Tim. Ooh, oh, oh boy, that's a tease. Yes, absolutely. Show it, Tim. That's great. You mean uh, you moved uh, Blue Ocean Companies to Jenkins Classic? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, go for it, Tim. Uh, this this will be an archive point that we will now show a fun demo. Oh, let's see. I probably have to allow you to share. No, I can share. It's fine. Oh, good. Okay. Cool. So, so this was based on a hack project that um, Cliff Myers did about four months ago. He lifted the um, graph components out to um, just a, on a standalone view on the job. Uh, so it's called the Pipeline Graph View plugin. Um, I don't think there's a screenshot in here, but um, so it's all based off of this. Um, so I've created three sample jobs with three different sort of pipelines. Um, we've got a like a very empty pipeline that's just got a few stages. Uh, so you'll see here, they're just completely empty, kind of standardish looking pipeline. Um, if we go in here onto a build, um, I've installed the Blue Ocean plugin just so I can compare it back to the regular one. Um, but if you go here, pipeline graphs, you've got the whole Blue Ocean graph here. Uh, you go to a failed build with a few different varieties. It's got, um, so if I go back here, you'll see it's got a variety of different stages, a unstable success, um, arid and caught, and a full-on failure. Uh, and then if you get a pipeline graph, you'll see that's all working. Um, and then a much more complicated one with parallel stages um, and nested branches. And so, yeah, this is declarative as well. So all this sort of, yeah, regular parallel nested inside of a parallel. And then, um, and you see it's mostly working. Um, the only bit that's not working is um, I haven't quite managed to identify the second nested stage properly. Um, but apart from that, skipped parallel, parallel nested stages, label on the branch. And this is this is a this is a regular problem in Blue Ocean. If you've ever tried to use Matrix, it's unreadable without hovering over it. Um, which is probably quite an easy fix, but um, um, the, another problem with Blue Ocean is that this graph is actually in a different repo in a different package. So even if someone were to try and fix this, they'd have to try and change the repo, another repo, and try and get someone to release that package and then get it into Blue Ocean. So a very high barrier to entry. Um, so just on the code, um, so Cliff has just lifted this out of that package. Um, he's converted it to TypeScript. Um, from JavaScript and from JSX to TSX. Um, so at very minimal changes, just ripping stuff out that's not needed. Um, I've lifted some very minimal um, code from Blue Ocean. So I've lifted the pipeline node graph visitor just to recreate the graph. Um, and then just the minimum, I removed some code that's not needed um, and lifted in just some, the minimum supporting code needed by the node graph visitor. Um, and then there's just a simple action, um, which just pulls in the icon and has a web method to just load the graph. So it's just a get request, which loads in JSON. Um, and then some very gnarly code to convert um, from the pipeline node graph visitors children um, so parent, parent approach where um, you get, um, but the response has a list of parents, but the graph expects a list of children. So you have to reverse the graph and rejoin it. And it's pretty nasty code. Um, but you just see, so it's probably, it's very hacky, but um, it mostly works. Um, and then you yeah, just a couple of sample pipelines in the tests um, and then some tests to make sure it's all building properly. Um, and then that's just asserting off the generated graph. And yeah. Then I suppose you could have something at the job level 
So when you use the pipeline stage view plugin, for example, it shows at the job level. So you can see multiple builds going or at least get, at least see the yeah. current build. Maybe we could have something at the job level that just embeds the graph of the last build or something like that. Yeah, it's quite trivial to implement. Yeah, it'd probably be a separate component I would have thought, just like a simplified graph. Mm -hmm. Kind of like the, the existing pipeline stage view thing, but not as complex and not as heavy as that's, that doesn't perform very well at all. It's far too heavy. Um, just like a, a much nicer one without log support probably, um, which is a lot lighter. Does um, the implementation still use Glosh and REST API under the hood? No, no, it's just got its own. Um, so if you go here, here, and then here, um, so it's okay. not blue action at all. Um, so it's just, just a new visualization being generated? From uh, yeah, it's just a new, so it's a, just, just a web method here in the action. Um, and then just using Jackson to um, serialize a list of stages, which is a POJO basically uh, with a list of children or a sibling um, and then just a few other mm. fields and whatnot. So it means we don't use pops up and other uh, things of lotion. No, is, no, not at all. Yeah, which is probably good. Yeah, the plan was just to look at um, look at polling um, while the build is running, and then once it's complete, you, you never need to re-render it. Um, and you're possibly even storing the state in a um, file on disk because you never need to recalculate it once the job is completed either. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so historical historical graphs don't have to be recomputed. I mean, the job is done. It's not going to change. Now, you indicated putting it into the build would be done without the log, so that and that was because pipeline stage views, log log rendering is expensive or painful or or not terribly useful. It's very slow. If you, if you ever load any, so if you lose, I mean, a lot of people use pipeline stage view because it's good to be able to see a combination of history timings um, across builds on average, but it also pulls in the logs um, and just a whole bunch of stuff. It's a, it's very slow until it's cached. Mm. A really poor user experience, but it kind of works. Excellent. Boy, Tim, that is marvelous. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so is that being discussed in the UX SIG? Where where should people go if they would like to be have more opportunities to talk about and see what your what your what your experiment is doing? Yeah, UX SIG. Damien asked about it at the last meeting, and I figured I'd spend some time now just hacking on it because we thought we thought it was really hard, but it wasn't actually that hard. That's awesome. Thank you. Isn't it an opportunity to call for contributor related to what we say on the advocacy uh, outreaching? I think this will be really rewarding for um, introducing new contributor because it's visual. Uh, I don't know the amount of knowledge required to put the hands on such thing, but there are TypeScript, which is, uh, let's say the usual contributor uh, might not have that kind of uh, knowledge or are not experts. So, Technically, and in terms of the feedback loop, it could be really rewarding and interesting to call for help on that part. What do you think? Is it only an idea or I really want your advice? Uh, I think at least Jesse, Oleg and Tim, because this is a really deep dive on, uh, I don't want to ask for contributor if they stumble across uh, needing to adding something, a deep dive on the core of Jenkins, that can be quite another issue. If we want to I feel them that, welcome. I think that this plugin is relatively simple because it's basically not a minus. Uh, the approach we tried to do before, it's just a uh, relatively clean code with just generating a data schema and visualizing it. Yeah, and the bigger part is where do you take it next though? It's do you put in like SCM information? Do you want a new logs viewer? Um, and yeah, like 
the suggestion before, um, recreating a better job widget um, to visualize the jobs over time. And um, yeah, so this one's not too far away from like an MVP, um, but it's, is it this plugin or is it another one where you extend it with some of the other suggestions? Okay, so and coordinating that in the UX SIG, so encouraging people to come come join the, the UX SIG and get involved. Uh, is is the repository public, Tim, that, that they could already start exploring in it or not yet ready? Uh, so I, I've pushed everything on my fork of Cliff's one. I plan to probably host it maybe next week. Um, yeah, probably host it next week and release an alpha or so if it's nearly ready. Hopefully, we'll see if I can fix the last couple of minor issues today, um, if I have time. But yeah, it's it's all pushed. It's all, it's all on my fork. Thanks for for all the work there, or anyone that has been involved on that. That's really neat from from a user perspective, at least. That's really cool. The question: Is it possible to repeat names on the task on the multi branch that we have there? I saw nested one, nested one. Same um, What am I running on? Um, so these here, these are just the um, stage names, if that's what you were asking about. Yeah, yeah, I wasn't sure if you could repeat names like that on stages. Yeah, it doesn't care. Um, they're not unique. Uh, they've got they get different IDs in the graph. So if you if you do inspect the metadata, there is different IDs that are used. Um, but apart from that, no, they're not unique. Thanks, Tim. That's that's amazing. Uh, that was that. Thank you. Thank you. Looking forward to that. Uh, any other topics to review here? I guess I have one shameless plug. Jenkins 2.277.1 will release March the 10th. That's the, the, the expectation anyway. We have about two weeks to do verification of the release candidate. Uh, Tim's published the release candidate. Please take it up and test it, uh, explore it. Uh, this is a major change, right? We've got the extreme unfork. We've got the a CG to string, spring security improvements. We've got jQuery update and we've got tables to divs in this release. This is a major, major release. Great chance to help us test it. All right. Thanks, everybody. Recording will be available separately. Thank you for joining the Contributor Summit. I will send a retrospective survey to everyone who registered. We had 69 or so register and encourage you to complete it. That survey will go out likely early next week. Uh, we'd like to try this again, we think, but we wanna learn more how we do it better. Thanks a bunch. Thank you, Mark, for running the summit. Well done. Thank you. Bye-bye.